On today's Join Us in France, the Moulin Rouge in Paris. This is Join Us in France, episode 126. Hello, I'm Annie, and I'm here to tell you about my travels and discovery of France, and also to interview listeners who visit France and have great tips to share from their own trips to France. I love France. I was born and raised here. I live in France, but in my early 20s, I left to go live in the UK for two years and then the US for 18 years. So I had to rediscover my own country when I moved back to France. So I had to rediscover my own country when I moved back to France. I actually turned 40 in France, so it had been a long time since I had lived here. I want to help you understand France better because I, like you, have a passion for travel done right. For show notes and links on this episode, and especially if we said some mysterious French words you didn't catch, go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash 126. On today's episode, I bring you two different perspectives on the Moulin Rouge experience in Paris, a very popular evening, I guess, for visitors uh, to do when they come to Paris. The first perspective is from Gary Turco, who visited Paris and went to the Moulin Rouge while on his honeymoon in Paris. And he and his wife loved it, and he will tell us why. Following that review, I talked to my friend Brenda, who you've also heard on the show before. And while she liked it, she had some misgivings about it. So we'll get two contrasting views of this same venue. I am hoping to produce more episodes that are limited to one topic, but hopefully with more than one perspective on the same place. It's a little more complicated to produce, but I think it will give you more in-depth and varied opinions. Now, if you like that, please let me know on the show page uh, comments or on the Facebook page. And if you don't like it, also let me know because obviously I'm hoping to improve the show, not make it worse. But before I get to the Moulin Rouge, I have to thank the 13 people who have donated to my Patreon campaign so far. I launched it uh, last week and I was, I was scared that I wasn't going to get any response. And you know what? I'm far from reaching my goal, but it's only been one week and I'm so gratified that 13 of you pulled the trigger and pledged to support the show. Every time one of those pledges comes through, I get an email and I get this great boost of energy for the show and renewed commitment to keep doing it and keep making it better for you and with you. So my thanks go out to Maggie Jones, Kaylee Spiney, oh, I hope I'm not massacring your names, you guys, Omar Rodriguez, Matthew Gamash, David Palacek, Brenda Moran, Elizabeth Houston, who also, she's such a great cheerleader, she created a, a beautiful image and a post on the Facebook closed group without any prompting from me, that touched me so much, Elizabeth, I cannot tell you, thank you, uh, also Steve Stegman, Jacqueline Romo, Jason Roberts, Stephanie Campbell, Robert Galtney, and Scott T. and Karen Phillips. Last week, I said that I would send out the link to the exclusive content that come with your Patreon donation, which is called Lunch Break French, as soon as your donation came in. Well, Patreon, who is much smarter at raising money than I am, said, no, don't do it that way. Set a date each month for the release of your bonus content and stick to it. So that's what I'm doing. Patreon supporters will get Lunch Break French on the second of each month. I have a couple recorded already and I'm really excited to help you improve your French skills. The first Lunch Break French is all about the details of how French train stations work. 
It includes an audio file in French, the French transcript, so you can follow along, and also hidden translation that you can reveal block by block if you need to. There are also photo illustrations, so you can see what I'm talking about, and you can find your way around the French train station like a pro. So, Patreon supporters, look for that email on November 2nd. And the only way to get Lunch Break French is to support the show on Patreon. So if you'd like to support and also get better at French, go to patreon.com forward slash join us. There are also two wonderful people who sent in a one-time donation using the tip your guide button on the website. Their support is very much appreciated as well. And I will read their comments at the end of the episode because I don't want to make uh, this announcement too long. We need to get to the Moulin Rouge right now. Hi, Gary. Bonjour, Annie. Thank you so much for having me. You are so welcome. So I wanted you to have you talk about Uh, your experience at Moulin Rouge. We have done another episode on romantic Paris where you and your wife, uh, newly married, uh, went to Paris on your honeymoon. And one of the things you did is you went to the Moulin Rouge. And uh, I already talked to my other friend Brenda about that. And I wanted to know how, you know, what you thought about that. Sure, sure. So th thank you so much for, for having me on and asking me about this because um, we had an amazing experience and I'm, I'm glad we're able to to talk about it because when I was researching for our honeymoon things to do, and yep. of course, Moulin Rouge is, is famous. Yeah. Um, it's old. I mean, I think it opened in 1889 yes. or somewhere <laughs> around around there. Um, yeah. And When you go on TripAdvisor or you, you talk to different Americans that have, you know, about it, um, a lot of people will say, oh, no, skip that. It's um, too touristy. Right. You know, but I understand that they, they say it's so touristy, but this is something that's like kind of quintessential Paris. I mean, 1889, it's like, the, you know, like the, the Eiffel Tower, you know, it's yes. uh, so You know, but then I would read other reviews and people would say they had an, an amazing experience. So it it we did not set our expectations extremely high. Uh -huh. uh, and but we were and, and maybe because of that, we were blown away. But I want to mention this first. Um, we there were different packages that you can purchase and we got the VIP experience because it was our honeymoon. Yes. Now, we didn't get the VIP with the dinner. Okay. Oh, because I, I had read that the food wasn't that great, so we ate in, in, in the area there. Yeah. Uh, although I, I regret that now because right near us, I saw people being served their dinner, and the food looked great. People looked like they were really enjoying it, and it looked like the service was unbelievable too. So I, I, I kind of regret that. But we got the VIP experience where they give you a really nice souvenir package. They give you champ a bottle of champagne. They um, nice. give you – Um, macaroons for, for, for dessert and you get a better table where you're not like squeezed in between people. You have your own table at two mm -hmm. right in the center on the top level where you can see everything. Mm. And this VIP experience gives a whole new meaning to the word VIP. Really? Uh, they, they really know how to do it, Annie. Um, there was this long line when we got there. And I remember reading that with the VIP, you kind of skip the line. So my wife, Leslie, you know, she just kind of wants to follow along and, okay, we have to get in this line. And I said, ah, you know, I don't know. These tickets were kind of expensive VIP. I don't know if we're supposed to be on this line. Let me ask the, yeah. uh, like, door person, the bouncer, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, the, in the front. And <laughs> bouncer. They, <laughs> Do they look it's like a an answer? Guy. Okay, okay. Oh, it's a big, big, big guy, you know. Big yeah. guy. And and, 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 and and you know, I can tell you, people had said because I'm on the word bouncer here. People had said that that area around Moulin Rouge could be a little, you know, dicey or whatever. That you mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, we we saw some shops and things like that that you know kind of looked like they were leaning that way. But if You just kind of like, you know, just go right to the Moulin Rouge. It, it's very safe and there's a lot of people around. And, I, you oh, know, yeah. I wouldn't worry about that um, yeah. at, at all. Um, so I showed the tickets to, the, you know, the, the person in the front. 
And he looked at the tickets and then looked at me. And then there was no waiting in line. Oh, my God, Mr. Turco, Mrs. Turco, thank you so much for, for, for being here. And, you know, opened up mm-hmm. the, the red chain thing and, and let us in. And then from that moment, we were passed from that person with our tickets to about like five more people. But it was done in a way where you weren't like running around with like a chicken without your head. Like, you know, why do we keep on getting passed in a way? It was it was done in a way where each person was passing you to someone else that took you another 10 steps in a way that made you feel like you were a celebrity. Yeah. You know? It's like, um, woo. No, you know, like, <laughs> like putting down the red carpet for you. And, wow. you know. If you want to go and check your code, you know, there could be a line with 50 people trying to check their coach. You're skipping it all. You know, right. there's a line for people that get seated at their table. You're skipping it all. You're just skipping each part and each line that other people are having to wait on. You get to your table, which says reserved. And yeah, very that nice. That's very nice. Awesome. Yeah. So that that was amazing. And then um, for the show itself, um, we had a lot of fun. I, it was actually Leslie's. Uh, my wife's one of her favorite things in the in, in entire um, honeymoon, I think. I mean, she just <laughs> really loved to watch it. Now, there are some parts that are very silly that um, they bring out like little miniature, you know, ponies. <laughs> okay. Um, but, but that we love animals, so that was kind of cute. There are yeah. things you don't expect to see, like a woman in a giant uh, swimming pool, fish tank, with giant snakes swimming around with the snakes and stuff like that, which is really cool and interesting to see, uh, but you didn't expect to see that in sort of a a dancing (laughs) cabaret, right? Uh, One of the best, there was an an act with a a guy doing a a puppet show that was really funny. Uh All of the the songs were in French, because then you have your your regular dancing and stuff like that, where the the women are, are dressed a little risque, there is a little nudity, but it's very classy. Yeah. You know, classy nudity. Well, it um, is the Moulin Rouge. I mean, they're not going to be, you know, wearing burkas ex- or anything like that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you know, you never you never felt uncomfortable, guys or girls. You felt very comfortable and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and all the songs were in French. But when they spoke to you, like the person doing the, the puppet act and stuff like that um, was in English. So oh. you... You understood, you know, I guess they know the audience that they're kind of catering to. And I think a lot of French people speak some English, too. So sure, they'll, sure. They'll, get, they'll get on. And, and when the songs are in French, it doesn't matter. It's beautiful, right? You don't need to know what they're saying. <laughs> so so is, uh, it, is it live? I mean, is there an orchestra or is it uh, live singing or? I would probably, I, it's probably lip singing, right? Okay, um, okay. They could very well be be singing or you know the the music and stuff like that is from a you know it's not a live orchestra it's a dj or whatever um and they definitely act like they're all singing but Mm -hmm. you know i don't know how much is really singing because when you're doing these dance moves and trying to sing i I could see that being very difficult you know um yeah yeah even in, in Las Vegas here, when you have Britney Spears and these people, people kind of mock them for, you know, they're partially singing and yeah. part of most of it is being played in with them kind of singing with their voices that have been yeah. recorded. But if you want to do all of these acrobatic moves and running around, That's you know, true. handstand. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably... I thought the best act of the entire show that had my heart pounding the whole time that I did, I wanted to turn away was this this couple that was on roller skates going around this you know small circle basically that the two of them you know just fit on and doing these spins and these acrobatic moves on there where one wrong move and somebody's going to you know crack open their head or something you know oh, it's going to yeah, be yeah yeah very bad now they didn't make any bad moves. I'm sure they practiced this a lot, uh, but <laughs> when you and the audience are in suspense because yeah. an accident could happen, and it was, um, you know, really, really unbelievable. So overall, we had a lot of fun. I I recommend it if you know what you're getting. 
You know, this is sure. sort of like it, it, it's a cabaret. It's a fun, lighthearted thing. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not you're not going to see some kind of serious award winning drama or anything. You're just mm-hmm. going to laugh, have some drinks and enjoy the yeah. company. Again, I recommend the VIP experience, though. Yeah, it's it's. I'm sure it's very lighthearted. I mean, it's it's just a fun experience. It sounds a little bit like vaudeville. Like you know, was it were they trying to make jokes as well? Uh, yes, uh, the different comedians and people that spoke, like the puppet act and things like that. That was uh, those were all jokes. Okay. Um, then you know the more acrobatic things or whatever. You know they don't really speak at all. It's just to the to the music. Yeah. Oh, very good. So it sounds like you recommend it. You had a good time. You would recommend it, but you would recommend doing it with a VIP experience. Well, you know, I, I, and, and it's more expensive, so you, you can't always do that. But I did see yeah. down below the, the people that didn't have the, the VIP and you're kind of you're on these big, long tables sometimes with people that you don't know if you're OK with that. You know, different people all kind of thrown together. And, you know, you can you don't have much elbow room, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you, know, you get friendly with your neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's not very long. I think the entire thing is like an hour and 45 minutes. So, you know, you can, you know, save a little and withstand that. That's fine. But when, you you know, we were going on a special romantic honeymoon, I wanted, you know, the red carpet out. And boy, they do a great job with that. that, that that's exactly what you got. So that's great. Do you remember the restaurant where you had your dinner because you didn't eat there? Um, that was up in uh, Montmartre. Okay. Am I saying that? Yes, um, Montmartre, yes. In in the square above where they have a ah. lot of restaurants to choose from. And that was an Italian restaurant that we w- went there in the, in the center of things. That was um, excellent, excellent food. I mean, better Italian than you're going to get in a lot of Italian restaurants here um, in, in L.A., Los Angeles, where we're from, for sure. Because everything was so, so fresh there. The pasta was fresh. The bread was fresh. So that was great. Oh, that's good. That's great. All right. Thank you so much, Gary. That's that's uh, very, very helpful. OK, I will talk to you soon. Uh, we still have to talk about Nice at some point. Yes, so, I'm excited. Thank you and au revoir. Au revoir. Support the show by going to patreon.com forward slash join us and get exclusive access to Lunch Break French. Welcome back to the show, Brenda. Hi, thank you for having me again. You are so nice. You're so generous with your time. I love you. <laughs> so Brenda is a good friend of mine. We've known each other since college and she is a Francophile and she was in Paris recently with me. But while in Paris with me, she did a few things that I didn't get to. Uh, And one of those is Moulin Rouge. You went to a show and a dinner, right? Right. That sounds like it. That that, that sounds at the same time like fun and horrifying. (laughs) (laughs) It was such a touristy thing to do. Is that right? Um, Yeah, you know, it was fun. You know, when when my husband did most of the planning on this trip, he was so excited. Mm -hmm. Paris is his favorite city in the whole world. And so when he said, can can we go to the Moulin Rouge? I thought, oh, that might be fun. You know, Toulouse Lautrec. Yeah. Of course, you know, famous movie with with um, Nicole Kidman and all of that. So I thought, oh, that might be fun. Yes, yes. So. I thought, why not? It might be fun. Um, and so he bought the reservations months ago, months before we went yeah. uh, online. So um, the website is really nice. It lets you, you prepay, but you, you order it, the dinner. You can tell there's two different menus to choose from. Hmm. Uh, and so you can look at the menus, see what they are. And then you choose from which one you want, and then you prepay it online, and it reserves it for you. It sends you the instructions, what time to get there. Nice. We had to get there, yeah, a half an hour before. They line you up, and they kind of escort you in one at a time and take you to your table. Um, There is a dress code. It's not super stringent. I mean, it's not like black tie. It's not even tie, but they do want you, you know, to to dress nicely, uh, button-up shirt, uh, wow. dresses for or, or nice pantsuit for a woman okay that nice nice so i'm i'm just going to give a tiny bit of background about it it's such uh this is one of these places that we could talk about for hours and i'm sure there are people who know so much more about it than i do because 
I'm uh, very thin on that. But anyway, Moulin Rouge is in the 18th. It's not very far from Montmartre. And the closest metro station is called Blanche. And it's on line two. This is the place with the, the iconic windmill, you know. And why did they put up a windmill? Well, in those days, uh, Paris had a lot of windmills. There were as many as 30 at once in the area. The, the Moulin Rouge as a place for shows was founded in 1889, and it has been imitated all over the world, including within Paris. So <laughs> other areas of Paris would have fake Moulin Rouge, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> and why is it a red, red windmill? Well, because the, the owner wanted it to be visible from the Grand Boulevard. What, and I don't think, you maybe it was true back then, but today you can't see it from the Grand no. Boulevard, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, construction has gone on, so things have changed a lot. The the late so this this is late eighteen hundreds and that uh, that time that time period in France was a time of peace and prosperity. Uh, French people were discovering Japanese art. Uh, artists loved to go to the cabaret. Of course, the most famous among them is Toulouse Lautrec, who loved this milieu and and he drew dancers all the time. He, he some of his most famous art is right there, you know, uh, at the cabaret. And Elise gave a great recap of the life and career of Toulouse-Lautrec on episode 20, uh, which was on Albi, but we also talked a, a lot about Toulouse-Lautrec. And also, I have to say that Toulouse-Lautrec was not from Toulouse. <laughs> I've been asked that mm -hmm. so many times. Oh, is Toulouse-Lautrec from there? No, he was from Albi. Not very far from Toulouse, but still, it's a, uh, it's a different city. Uh, now, at the time, so late 1800s, every artist who mattered went to the cabaret. Proust, Braque, Modigliani, even a very young Picasso, they all patronized uh, these cabaret-type establishments, and the most famous among them was the Moulin Rouge. French people were seeking beauty and pleasure. And at the time, looking at women's bodies was really scandalous. It was forbidden and therefore really enticing. And just showing women's arms and legs would just draw, you know, large crowds of, of men. Um, and they... Uh, they had shows, and the types of shows that they had evolved over time. At first, they were inspired by circus acts. Uh, and also, it was a place for about 10 years where every night at 10 p.m., they would do a dance. And so, if you wanted to dance in Paris, that's where you went. Then in 1902, they changed it a little bit to more like plays with live music and then came a very famous Miss Tenguet she was a very famous dancer and she she's the one who introduced all the feathers and the gold and all that and she ran the show and did the choreography and that sort of thing until 1928 and then of course both world wars uh, the Moulin Rouge had to close at times but it lived on People like uh, Edith Piaf uh, sang there quite a bit. And, and American Josephine Baker uh, is also very famous, and she danced there a lot. And she deserves her own show. We've already uh, talked about it with Elise. We're going to do one on her. So it's, it's, a it's a really famous place for entertainment, and it has been much imitated all over the world. The question is, it's, is it still as fresh as it once was? My impression is that it's not, but you were there, so maybe you can tell us about it. Um, yeah, you know, I think I, I went into it with not a whole lot of expectations. I don't know what I was expecting. I, I know Moulin Rouge as the icon of Paris that you have just described uh -huh. um, with a great deal of history. And, of course, you can't think of Moulin Rouge without thinking about the 
paintings and the posters of right. that to and the Kong protect. Kong. Well, you know, I didn't yeah, mention the Kong Kong, but that's huge. Yes, the Can Can, and and that's I think what we were expecting more of a vintage show like that to walk into a show and see um, more of a vintage what you would have seen from a hundred years ago or uh-huh. one hundred fifty years ago or that that uh, gold. Uh, Golden Epic, or what? We, what do they call that? Uh, the sec- siècle de Cirque du Soleil. Lumière. Yeah, yeah. That golden era, the eighteen nineties era. Um, so uh, first, I wanted to start with it, kind of in the order. We were sat down. We had a, a really nice waiter. He brought us dinner. Um, we had already ordered. So he just wanted some of the specifics, like you know, temperatures on the meat and that type of thing. He we had bought wine. Uh, champagne came with dinner. We also ordered a bottle of wine. Mm-hmm. Um, all this was very, you know, well. The, the the waiters were really nice. the The food was okay. It was not the best I've ever had. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a little bit on the dry side and yeah. a little overwhelming. Um, I think they were just kind of. <laughs> Resting on the laurels of the name of the establishment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is um, rather sad because we did eat at another icon. Uh, we ate at, at uh, on the Eiffel Tower, the Jules Verne, and they pulled it. That was an amazing meal. Huh. So it was just kind of an interesting uh, yeah. uh, contrast between the two. Yeah. So the meal, the meal was a little disappointing, um, but it wasn't horrible. Mm-hmm, you know, it, mm-hmm. it was okay. And uh, we had other, uh, pretty much the entire establishment is all uh, tourists, of course. You know, this is a, a very much a tourist attraction. We had an English family sitting nearby, and they had some young girls there. Mm. And so, you know, it was very nice. We're all chatting, and there were families. And then after the meal was cleared away, they then brought in the people who had just signed up for the show so we were sitting at a table that actually sat six people Ah. but they sat us two of us across from each other right next to the railing and then they filled the other four seats with people who were just coming in to see the show so we had a yeah so a couple uh, people who were friends from australia came in and another uh, family from actually they were all from australia Ah. that sat down with us Huh. Um, anyways, but th- so they filled in all the extra seats once the dinner was done. Okay. And then that was when they started the show. Once they got everyone seated, they started the show. And it, uh, the show, I think, is what shocked a lot of people were not expecting. Uh, I, I think how I described it to you the next day when you asked me was I went expecting the can can and got surprised with Las Vegas Showgirl. Um, ah. because that's, that is the, the show we got at the very beginning was, uh, uh, topless, uh, women. Uh, it was done very artistically and beautifully. It wasn't done lewdly, but it was much like a, a Las Vegas showgirl type of, yeah. of performance. Yeah. Um, so a lot of, yeah, a lot of topless performances, a lot of expressions of surprise, especially from the English family that was sitting nearby. <laughs> <laughs> with I their young that. kids. Yes. Yeah, so that's that's kind of why I felt like it's important to put that out there right now with you and your show is because I don't I wasn't expecting it and I know I wasn't the only one because of the conversation I had with the Australians that we were talking to uh before were all also, also very surprised as well. Yeah. Um we were just kind of expressed some I mean there was no sh- there was no shock or indignation and I wasn't you know, I, I got used to it after a while. It was a bit of a surprise at first. Yeah. Um, but again, it was done tastefully. Uh-huh. Um, the The performances were nice. They were kind of disjointed. So it wasn't like there was any kind of theme. I know the the title of the show was Fairy. Okay. So they were, and there was. There so was that's Fairyland or something. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so that that being rather general, there were some random moments where a woman jumps into a. They raise a big tank from the the stage, a giant water filled tank, with a bunch of swimming bow constrictors or whatever big big snakes those were, and she jumped. <laughs> <laughs> she jumps into the tank and starts swimming with around snakes? with them and holds. 
Yes. Oh, good. So God. that was a random moment. And then there was a couple other random moments where they brought little those little miniature horses on Did stage what? and they were dancing around with them. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds and weird. So- yeah, it was really random. That's what I that's kind of what I mean. Now there was also a number toward almost towards the about three quarters of the way through the show where they actually came out in very traditional Moulin Rouge like you see on the posters, um, dressed, you know, with the frilly skirts mm-hmm. and short sleeves and the little bloomers, you know, and they uh they did like a, a can can act and oh, actually good, if you on the website. Yeah, exactly. And if you go on the website, that's the picture you see. So oh, yeah, it's a little, that's... yeah. Right. Cause that's what it's known for, right? The can can. Yeah. So that one performance was really enjoyable. And it was, I, I, I was hoping to see a little bit more like that. Like what I would have li- I liked to have seen kind of a, a show in, uh, a piece of out of time, you know what I mean? Kind of like, I felt like I would have liked to have seen, felt like I was stepping back in time to that, uh, that gold age and experiencing what the Moulin Rouge would have been then. And I did not feel that, uh, from the decor to the, you know, the the beginning part of the, the performances, that one moment. It it would be tremendously fun to recreate like acts that Miss Tanguet did or some that uh, uh, Josephine Baker did. Right. Even have a woman imitating, you know, acting out her part would have been amazing. I would have loved to have seen pieces, you know, that would have been truly unique. I feel like the Moulin Rouge is trying to compete with the other area shows in the area because as we walked out you saw the advertising for all the other shows Mm -hmm. and they were much those las vegas showgirl type acts yeah and i feel like maybe knowledge feels like they need to do that but you know what they have the brand they have the name they have that iconic status they really don't need to do that and if they wanted to make this a great attraction for tourists they could do like you suggested pieces out of time because they've been this icon in Paris for, for so, so long. so long and so imitated all over the world. I mean, th- yes. that's one thing. If you want to innovate, I, I feel the same way about uh, famous rock bands uh, that they go on stage and they only perform their latest album that nobody's heard, mm-hmm. you know. And yeah. th- there are a few who do that. And I'm like, dude, I... I know your songs from 25 years ago. The songs you wrote last year, I don't care. I've never heard them. And, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm not that big of a fan, you know. And and it's it's not... I mean, I understand why they do that. They want to keep producing fresh content. But when you're that iconic, you know, people mm-hmm. expect, like, memory lane, you know. Uh, yeah. Expect, yeah. And a best hits from the Moulin Rouge out of history would have been amazing yeah yeah Um, yeah yeah. and I think that's probably I honestly feel at least from the people around me I honestly feel that's what they were looking for too Mm -hmm. and what I know that's what I was looking for yeah so that's too bad that's too bad that they didn't um I guess that's a that's a policy I mean that's just uh like a, a decision that they have to make Mm-hmm. Because of it, course yeah. you you run you run the risk of becoming like you're done you're done creating once you just do the memory lane thing exclusively. Oh well, yeah, but you need to do both. Like you need to be, and they kind of did both, but maybe not enough of the one and too much of the other. Right, just one one little can can routine out of all of it. I think I would have liked to have seen. Mm-hmm. How many people more. does the room hold, more or less? Is it like huge? Oh, or? there were hundreds in there. Yeah, it was pretty big. Huh. Yeah, there were, there were hundreds in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how long does it was packed pretty full for the show? Yeah. So the meal we went, we got uh, we got there at seven to start the meal, and that lasted till nine. And then the show was about an hour and a half to two hours, and we were we got out of there around eleven. Wow, the show started late. at nine. Yeah, and then you know the it, the coolest thing about Paris is we're walking. And we opted instead of switching subway lines that we just walked down to the uh, subway line we needed to get straight home. 
And yeah. we, so we walked down a long stretch of the, uh, the area, the Montmartre area and felt perfectly safe. It was 1130 at night. Oh yeah. Um, you know, there were a couple of th- a couple of places you walk by that look a little bit, you know, you know, it is the red light district of Paris. So, yeah. Yeah. You know. But you know, I never felt unsafe at all. Yeah. So that, yeah. I mean, that's the beauty of Paris. I mean, yeah. So it sounds like if you were to do this again, you wouldn't go for the dinner again. You would just do the show maybe, if that. If if I were to go back, mm-hmm. um, it, for example, if I was taking somebody who, would, who wanted to go see it, I would suggest the show. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, i just go for the show and eat somewhere else beforehand and, and, and uh, show up at 9 to uh, go to the show. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely my recommendation. Yeah, that's that sounds that sounds reasonable because if if the food was eh whatever you know yeah then and you know you can get much better food at even the tiniest little family run cafe or brasserie around the corner you know oh yeah oh yeah yeah there's no question that there's good food in Paris it's just yep. that they're trying to serve a bunch of people quickly before the show starts. Maybe that's a problem. Ha- have, right. you, have you attended similar events like in Vegas or things like that? Because I have been to things like that in Vegas where it's dinner and a show. I wonder if it's like Vegas or not. Oh, you don't know. Um, I have done dinner and a show before. Not that particular type of show, but I have done dinner and a show before. And um, it's about on par with a dinner theater type of meal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nothing remarkable, but nothing really. Yeah. You know, that stands out. They you know, you the, nothing horrible. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not. It's definitely not the best meal I had in Paris. Not even close. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. All right. Well, it sounds like uh, it's kind of a meh that one, huh? I mean, okay. But... Yeah. Yeah. And I think if you go into it knowing what you're getting, you might right. be happier. Right. Um, Definitely part of my reaction was the surprise at mm-hmm. knowing that I, you know, and once I got into it, it was, it was an enjoyable show. Like right. I said, it was a bit random, but it was enjoyable. Right. Um, I, I remember and, you told me when, uh, when we got together later, you said it was kind of like maybe a, a similar show on a cruise ship or something like that, you know? Yes. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, right, so like something like one of those variety shows you go uh, go to to see on a cruise ship or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Which, I mean, <laughs> only with more breasts. <laughs> a lot more breasts. <laughs> yeah, they show more, huh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is friends. We're not afraid of you know. And it used to be a big ooh la la. They're showing you know arms and legs. Well, now you're lucky if they have anything on at all. Like. Yeah. Lady, I didn't want to see that much. <laughs> Put there a guy on right now. <laughs> yeah. I want to see some men here. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, da. This is wrong. <laughs> anyway. <Yeah. laughs> oh, very good. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much, right. Brenda. <laughs> Glad to be of help. All right. Talk to you soon. Okay, take care. Au revoir. Au revoir. Before I let you go today, I also want to thank the two people who made a one-time donation this week and read the notes that they wrote to go along with their donations. You can make your own one-time donation by clicking on the Tip Your Guide button on jonasandfriends.com. Jacqueline Romo, who also pledged on Patreon. You are totally going the extra mile, Jacqueline. Thank you so much. She wrote, Annie, you are such a wonderful ambassador for your country and the community that you have created with a closed Facebook group is really awesome. I know that this takes a lot of time and energy and I hope you know how much you are appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I hope to be a good ambassador for my country and I also love participating in the Facebook closed group. I probably shouldn't check it as much as I do, but I like it there. So, you know, anyway, another donation came from Richard Pugliesi. And thank you, Richard. He wrote, Annie, thank you for all your hard work and excellent presentation. I can't tell you how much knowledge I was able to put 
to good use during our trip to Paris last fall. I'm in the initial phase of planning another trip to your wonderful country, and I'm and and then it got cut off, so he ran out of space, so we didn't finish his thought. But thank you for the kind words, Richard, and um, I'm really glad the show helped you on your last trip to France, and that you want to do it again. That is great. And last but not least. Next week's show should be about the Opéra Garnier, one of my favorite places in the world. And I will be able to give you a lot more details about the tours that Elise and I are planning on. Yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> I don't want to say anymore because we are going to meet and iron out all of details. And there are so many details about a tour like that. So um, stay tuned. Probably you'll know as much as we do next week. Au revoir! Hi guys, it's Annie again. When you go to joinusinfrance.com, and I hope you do, you will see two important sidebars. The one on the left is there to help you find the information you need. Episodes are categorized by region, for instance, Normandy, Southwest, Paris, Alsace, whatever, but also by show type. There's a category for trip reports, another for transportation, another for food and wine, museums, etc. So if you have an idea what you're looking for, but you can't remember the details, you can narrow it down by using the sidebar on the left that says episodes by categories. The sidebar on the right is where you can shop for hotels, car rentals, flights, and earn the show a commission. This is no different than what TripAdvisor does. If you read TripAdvisor reviews and you book a hotel, they get a commission. You pay the same price for that hotel regardless. Well, it's the same for joinusinfrance.com. If you listen to the show and enjoy it, when you are ready to book, go to joinusinfrance.com first, click on those banners on the right of the website, and shop around. This episode is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives International License.